ಶ್ರೀಗುರುಮಹೋರಾಧಿಮಧಾವಶಂ ಪ್ರಾಪ್ತೋಯಶ್ರಪೀತ್ರೀಪಾಯಶ್ರೀಗುರುಮಿತಂಶ್ರೀಮೀಲಾಶ್ವತಿ ಮಾರ್ಪಿತಿಚರಿಂಚಿರಕ್ಷಿಸುಭಕ್ತಿಸ್ವಿಂ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನಾಕಿತೋಕಮಲಾಯಕಕ್ಷೋಶ್ವಾಂಬರೋಧ್ವಿಜಾಬುರೋಧಿಗಾರ್ಮಪಾಲ್
Vrinde Namaste. Uh huh. What is, where's that verse from? Lalita Zaki did this exact same question two weeks ago. You didn't listen to that class. That's, that was a Q&A in Kansas. She said exactly, exactly the same question. <laughs> that last verse that you mentioned that it ends with Vrinde Namaste Chiranarvindam. Can you please explain what do you mean? Because that last line is so familiar. It's a, it's a whole series of verses that have yeah, I mean that that line. Yeah, this in brief, I'll reply. The extended replies on that yeah, other that lecture, <laughs> but that comes from the Brinda Devi Astakam. So it's an Astakam. So as an Astakam, generally they they end with the same line every single verse, with the exception of the <clears throat> the Fal Shruti, which is like the ninth verse, which shares like the blessing for one who sings this. Mm -hmm. This will happen. Generally, that's the last line is not the same as we know with Urash come and others. But all the other lines end with the same line. Rindin must teach it and other than the Rindin must teach it and So this is a brain that they be asked to come. It's an eight verse composition by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in praise of Srimati Brinda Devi, who is none other than Tulsi Marani in the Lila as a the Brindavan Lila as a Dutika or as a lady messenger who is very much as we know brinda very much in the line with the yoga maya purnamasi agency of orchestrating all the necessary adjustments arrangements in the lila specific flowers to blossom in a particular way specific seasons to be invoked for the lila dynamics to carry on smoothly and all, all the necessary agents she herself has for sending messages and bringing messages uh, and so on. So yeah, and that that last verse that that's the eighth, the last verse of the Brinda Devi Ashtakam. I mean, not the ninth verse, but the eighth, the last verse, of the official Ashtakam. And that's that's a classical also expression of of the authors of this type of compositions in which they present their own case at the end of the composition. They address first their their deity, if you will, and then they present their particular situation. With full humility and end up like wrap up like asking for one last blessing, please, before I drown in the ocean where I am. No, I'm literally Vishwanachakor Tagur is describing that this verse because he's saying Bhaktiya Bihina Aparada Lakshai briefly mentioned this other lines. Bhaktiya Bihina Aparada Lakshai. So Bhaktiya Bihina means I am the void of bhakti. Mm -hmm. So if, you can not have bhakti. Bhakti is not inherent. <laughs> of course, this is Chakravarti Thakur in full humility, which is another way of proving how much bhakti he has. <laughs> but he's saying bhaktiya bihina. Bihina means without, and bhaktiya means bhak without bhakti. I am devoid of bhakti. Aparadha lakshai. Due to lack, lack means thousands of aparad, of offenses. So due to so many offenses and the void of bhakti, first line. Then he says, Shiptas Chakamadi Tarangamadhye, which means I am in the Madhye. Madhye means in the middle of Taranga, on the waves on, of an ocean in which there is Shiptas Chakamadi. I am drowning in the midst of an ocean, in the on the ocean of Kama Adi. Kama means selfish desire or lust, sometimes that's translated. And Adi means etc. So Kama, Kroda, Loba, Madha, Mohammed, Sari, all these sometimes called enemies, <laughs> which are not outside, <laughs> remember. So I'm drowning in, in this ocean. No, as we know, sometimes some Sari is depicted as an ocean, and we try to cross the ocean, but in the ocean there will be sharks and crocodiles and all these mm, sea beasts. <laughs> and in this case, refer to all these anartas. So he's this first two verses, he's depicting his so-called pathetic situation no? which actually helps us to locate our actually our that's us if basically not him <laughs> and then he, he again presents this very last prayer hope against hope as they say no kripa maitvam sharanam prapanam no? so kripa maitvam so be kripaya show your mercy to me sharanam who have taken shelter unto, unto you, basically. 
So I'm taking shelter, I'm surrendering unto you. So I'm, I'm yours. I have no independent existence. So I'm your slave. So you are you're my master. So you can, my mistress in this case. <laughs> and you can do with me as, as you want. So please consider this. Kripamoid and be merciful with Kripamoid. Krishna's Kripamoid. And sometimes Shiradis Kripamai or Karuna Mai. So here, Brinda Devi is addressed similarly. Kripamai Tuam. You are full of mercy. Mai means like you are made of. Uh, that's your whole being is made of Kripa. So given that, please show some mercy to this fallen personality, bring the namaste and the And therefore, I namaste, I offer namaste, pranam, bring the to bring the charanara binda means to the lotus feet of. So I offer pranam to your lotus feet, oh, binda devi. Of course, for the verse to make even more sense, we have to go through the first seven, <laughs> since this is the last. So you go through the first seven and then you have a bigger picture of what was already said and all the glories of Brinda Devi and so on. And then the last appeal make full circle and full sense. You know? so, but this is a typical prayer sometimes used also for Mangal Charan as I do. Sometimes pray for Tulsi Devi is invoked, bring the eye to Lassi Devi or some others, or to her form as Brinda Devi generally at the end of Mangala Charan there are invoked. I mean, there are different ways of doing that. There's not one specific way, but that's one of them. Now, where's that prayer found? Where can I find it? As I told you, Brenda Devi Ashtakam of Vishwana Chakravarti oh, okay. So it, it's Google. not... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't want I would like to conclude saying Google. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good way, way of going. Or, of course, in our song books, because it's not that it's in a book that he wrote that includes that prayer, no? because many of our acharyas they have written this like short astakams or poems of two, four verses, eight verses, and they were not like systematically compiled in one particular book by themselves. Sometimes in time, some other of his followers have done that. For example, Srila Raghunathas Goswami composed many, many, many. And they were composed in one called Stava Bali, in one like collection of, of poetry. Stava Bali means like, yeah, like a garland of, of prayers. No? And Srila Rupa Goswami similarly has Stava Mala. Mm -hmm. And you there have like, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say hundreds, but at least, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 of these maybe astagams or sometimes four verses or sometimes. 20, 30, depending each one. But again, they are not like generally known as a book or as a part of the book, but eventually they were compiled in that form of collection. In the case of Vishwanatha Kvartaka, we don't have that because uh, although he wrote some astakams, of course, we think Guru Astakam mm -hmm. was written by him, Rinda Devi Astakam was written by him, and there are a few other astakams he has written, but at least to my knowledge, there is no like official book compilation with all of them, but there are relatively easy, easily found. The Bhakti Vinod Thakur, did he write his, <clears throat> like he has the, the Kalpa, I don't know, there's a number of, seems like books of Bhakti Vinod Thakur's prayers, did he write them like in a book form or a bit where they compiled? Yeah, he, he was a little bit more like systematic in that. Yeah. So he had more like when you hear on the Saranagati, mm -hmm prayers that sometimes we sing some songs of that and we have them in our song book and may we may not know that they are actually part of a whole song book that he himself <laughs> compiled <laughs> and we may, we may sing whatever here amara jivan or mama mana mandire or manasa deho geho all of them are one song in a group of songs of about saranagati or about this or that topic that in that case, generally, Bhakti Notaku was more, a little bit more organized. <laughs> yeah. But it's nice. It's important. I mean, it's, 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 I would say it's as important as, in one sense, studying the, the books in, in a more prose form that they may write also to go through their songs because it's a way where they are like pouring their, their heart and expressing themselves in a very natural, organic way. 
And of course, those expressions of spiritual emotion for us constitute the, the goal to attain. Like, like we were saying the other day, I mean, yesterday in the one Spanish q and I was doing, that we were speaking about the appearance day of Janava Devi, Sita Devi, and the Tirupab of Madhu Pandit. And sometimes we may think, we, will, we may do check the calendar and say, let's see, oh no, okay, let's not go for him, not Jamastami, not Radastami. Oh yeah, Madhu Pandit, I don't know who he is, no problem. It's nothing very important. You continue without making some effort to to get to know them, you know? And, and and that's not very, that's not precisely auspicious. <laughs> because this personality, I mean, the fact that I do not know them doesn't mean that they are not important. No? It's like, if I do not know someone, it means doesn't matter because I don't know them. <laughs> I should become known to them. <laughs> And something where to begin, or maybe I, I, I may make some little effort trying to know about them. Why? Because all of them are basically personifications, embodiments of the type of love that we have as the goal of our practice. And we have a certain goal to attain, the ultimate objective, and we have these personalities who embody the goal through their teachings, through their life example. So if I do not show that much interest in knowing how the goal of life personified is playing itself out in front of me in the form of all this personality. I don't have time for that. It means basically I don't want to attain the goal of my practice. No, you follow my point. It's contradictory when one says, I'm back time practicing sadhana so I have to attain bhava and prema as my last goal. But when that goal comes to me in personified form, very pragmatic in the way of hearing how they deal in their life, oh no, 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 I don't have time. <laughs> So, so it's important to to spend time in these things. That's my point. No? In these things, in these songs that actually are ways in which these prem-like personalities are <laughs> opening their hearts uh, to Krishna, but for us as well. So we can delete, de obtain so much benefit. So it, it's, it's important to be, yeah, be careful of this type of laziness because laziness can, can happen. I mean, life happens laziness happens no? and so many ways of laziness it's not necessarily you're not waking up at 3 a.m for mongolarty or something <laughs> i mean it's i mean you can spend 15 minutes per day in getting to know a little bit more who mother planet is <laughs> and you have google now <laughs> with all i mean you appreciate that because you may say oh Maharaj, i don't know where to look well you put mother pandit and you will find so much <laughs> No? So my point is that it, it may be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, hopefully more, but you have to begin somewhere. And when you take the time for those things, you realize, wow, this was worthy of investing my, worthy investment of my time. You know what I'm so the same with the songs. No, it's not, I mean, I, of course, everything is in, in Srinam, in Maha Mantra, but also, as it does always say, which capacity do we have to extract everything from Maha Mantra? So all these other songs from the songbook are extensions of the Maha Mantra. All that is in the Maha Mantra is expressed in a more specific way in this in all these other songs. So it's important that we get to get to know them, to sing them, and to to get to know what we are singing also, because sometimes and the devotees for some reason they they are not able to. Maybe, I mean, to learn the meaning of the words in Bengali and Sanskrit, which I, I'm not blaming them for that, but my point is, it's, an, it's good that you understand what you are singing. <laughs> that will help a lot to, to, to establish an emotional bond with, because you are supposed to, you know that those songs are the power of the heart of someone, but if I don't have a clue what they are actually saying, I'm losing something important. No? So somehow, or learning the meaning of the songs, or, or reading the meaning after, in between, or or as, as if someplace it's done, they also sing the songs in their local language. No problem. <laughs> no no crime for doing that. <laughs> of course, someone has to do that, adapt that. We have that in Spanish, fortunately. Like almost all the song books, all the songs of the book, song book were translated into Spanish. And, and okay, I, of course, I, I, I like Sanskrit and Bengali and the sound of it and the language and there is a mysticism in that and somehow I I got to learn the meaning of, of the word. So I 
generally can sing and un understand what I, I'm saying and try to connect emotionally, but if that's not possible for some reason, do follow my point. No? We, we should try to do those, to, to understand how important those things are and to do that in a way that actually remains important and relevant for us because it's not just, okay, Maras told me these songs are very important, so let's sing all the Saranagati of Bhaktivinoda Tagore in Bengali for two hours. And I asked you, so what was the song about? And like, Saranagati? <laughs> That's the only thing you can see because you may not have had a clue. And at one point, your mind may go blank if you just are singing sounds that you don't follow for too, more, too long. So it's important somehow to, to connect with the meaning. It may be even more, in some cases, more even convenient to read the meaning than instead singing in another language that you do not... I mean, I'm not singing... I'm not saying replace one thing with the other or anything, but try to do it in such a way that that we do not incur in, in, in what Rupa Goswami also calls Niyama Graha. No, it's a way of Niyama Graha, which means following the rules and regulations without understanding why you're doing that. So it's the same, similar, singing the song that you don't have a clue what's about. <laughs> it may end up in some form of mechanistic repetition or, or, or at the end it's, it's not yeah, it's not favorable to the expression of one's own feeling. No? So anyhow, it's another topic, but connected to to all this. So not to underestimate the songbook. <laughs> I remember one one year in Argentina, we the inspiration came and said, "Okay, let's make to this year because at that time that was like ten years ago. We we're doing like yearly series of lectures." And, and I was I was mostly staying in one single place, so I could like organize <laughs> with anticipation. So we will have like every day one class in the morning for a year, almost some interrupt interruption. But generally, that was. And one year we say, okay, let's make the whole year just all lectures will be about the songbook. So every day one song, and a class about the song. So we did the whole year like that. It was like three hundred classes or something or and it was really nice because I mean for everyone of us because we will sing the song first we will explain and try to like unpack all, all, all unfold all the content and all of us were surprised like wow I never like enter I never get to that point of the song apart from just singing it the follow up is not about just singing the song, but it's nice also to see to reflect on the content. I realize, oh, what's actually in the song? It's not only what I think it is. So that gives you meaning, and you sing again the song from another place, and and I know so many other songs that again maybe not the in the top five of the songbook, <laughs> but are equally important, and, and, and it's a way of discovering. Getting to know more our authors, you know, Thakur Bhaktino, Narottam Das, Vishwanath Chakravartakur, mostly. So. Now I'm with Brahma Stuti, <laughs> not now. <laughs> I think it will be quicker if you learn Spanish and you can go through those series yourself. <laughs> it may take less time. <laughs> you did that whole series on. Of yeah, we did that. I mean, that was something, yeah. A trailer of the six verses. That's something, yeah. <laughs> Actually, those six are part of, of the Navadi Bhavataranga. So it's part of, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a song if you want to put it somehow. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, what else? Any other question, topic? I was listening to your um, to your class about is it okay to pray for people who are suffering? And in that class you mentioned, which was an, an amazing class, thank you. That, um, you mentioned about the difference. You were saying don't just do things that please Krishna, but do things in a way that is pleasing to Krishna. So I was hoping that you would be able to um, unpack that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So I, I think I will briefly repeat just in case here, Dr. Mm-hmm. is asking. <clears throat> Basically, if, if we can unpack a little bit the notion of not just doing something that pleases Krishna, but try to do something with the intention of pleasing Krishna. Mm-hmm. So if in we can, in a way that is pleasing to him, whatever, yeah. So, yeah, yes, I, and important point. Mm-hmm. Somehow we can connect that with the definition that Srila Rupa Goswami gives of bhakti in, in 11th verse of the first uh, section of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Anyabila sita sunyam jnana karma adhyana britam anu kulena krishnanu silanam bhakti ruttama. So there he is describing Uttam Bhakti or Paramount Paramount devotion and describing the Tatashta Lakshan and Sarup Lakshans of Uttam Bhakti, you know, the incidental act- attributes and the intrinsic attributes, if you will. If you will. So in- incidental, which come as a byproduct of, if you will, are uh, Anyabila Sita Sunyam and Jnana Karma Dhyanabritam. These bhaktis, this devoid of all separate ulterior, ulterior motives, and jnana karma adi and abritam, as Kumarash will say, unencumbered by jnana karma and so on, adi, again, karma adi. And then comes the sarup on the intrinsic qualities of bhakti, which is Krishna anukulena Krishna anusilanam bhakti rotama. So it means three sarup lakshanas. And I go to the point after this. First one is that this bhakti has Krishna as its object. No, it's not bhakti towards my grandmother, towards my cat, towards my president, but Bhagavan Sri Krishna, he is the Vishaya Alambana, the object of bhakti. So that's one of the three. Anu Krishna Anusilanam. Anusilanam means it's an ongoing culture, practical action that is performed in for the pleasure of him. And Anukul. That's a word we are important word here, which is anukul means you tell me. Yes, yes. So anukulya anukul. Anukulya is sankal, but many times we hear this word. So anukul means it has to be favorable to Krishna. So the commentators, like Srila Jiva Goswami, for example, he comments on this verse. Vishwanath Chakwari Thakur also a very long commentary because it's a very important verse, maybe the most well-known verse of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, upon which the whole book like expands. So pages and pages of commentary. So I'm saying this because again I say something in the here, but I also give you homework mm-hmm. to for further <laughs> exploration of the topic by going to the commentators in detail. And each word is described by them in the commentary. So you can write, go to Anukul, the word Anukul, which means yeah, favorable. So Srila Rupa Goswami, uh, sorry, Srila Jiva Goswami, he's commenting this word Anukul can, yeah, can be taken as twofold. On one side is doing things that please Krishna and in a deeper sense doing something that with the intention of pleasing Krishna. So it may seem the same, so I will clarify. <laughs> Actually, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing is that you can do something that pleases Krishna incidentally, mm. without having the intention of pleasing Krishna. For example, I don't know, Krishna likes something, Bananas. <laughs> and you may give a banana, but without the intention of pleasing Krishna, just casually. So that, that's something that pleases Krishna, banana. But your intention was not to please Krishna. Your intention was maybe neutral or even, who knows? You gave him a poison banana, some putana like act. <laughs> and Krishna likes to, dress, to drink milk. So you can say, oh, Putana was favorable. <laughs> no. No. Krishna says in the Gita, Manmana, always think of me. You can say, well, Kamsa was 24 hours absorbing Krishna. He was doing something that pleases Krishna. Yes. 
but no, because his intention was to kill Krishna. <laughs> you start to see the difference. So Jiva Goswami gives the example of a warrior. He said the warrior can come to the... When you speak about the warrior, his weapons are kind of included in the equation because a warrior without weapons is like no warrior. Well, he's too good of a warrior. He doesn't need weapons. <laughs> but generally he has weapons. So he will say they are assumed and they are like included in the warrior designation. But sometimes we have to make a difference between the warrior and the weapons. And for example, he says, if the warrior goes to the kingdom and the king receives the warrior and say, feed the warrior, they won't, be, they won't bring a separate play for the weapons. Mm. No. <laughs> the, the weapons do not need sabji, dal, and chapati. Mm -hmm. No. In that case, a difference is required between the two of them, between the warrior and the weapon. So similarly, Jiva Goswami says, although sometimes we can, this idea may sound the same, something pleasing to Krishna, in some cases, we need to make a difference between doing something that pleases Krishna and having the intention. Again, generally, it can be included in the same equation. You know? Ideally, you some a devotee, if we are speaking about devotees here, a devotee will be concerned what places Krishna and will try to invest himself, herself in that which places Krishna with an intention to please Krishna. But in some cases we see situation where that's not the case, as some of the ones we were mentioning. Kamsa was doing something pleasing to Krishna, hmm? but not with the intention of pleasing Krishna. There are many examples in that line. Or the opposite idea. Now, technically speaking, in Shastra, you never heard uh, Krishna likes to be tied to a mortar <laughs> <laughs> or to be chased with a stick. That's not like part of our sadhana. You do not do not serve a deity in that way. You know, part of the paraphernalis one stick to you know, to hit Madhav you know, and you tie Mahaprabhu to the other. But in some extraordinary cases although they are doing something that overtly doesn't please Krishna, the intention to please Krishna is such that in those cases, one is overriding the other one. You follow my point? Like the famous example of Vidura's wife, she's giving Krishna banana peels. That's not in the Archana Padati, you know, list of possible offerings. So when our church describe all the preparation that Mahaprabhu was offered, you never find banana peels. So... Why Vidura's wife has to make her own cook cookbook or something? <laughs> Ecstatic cookbook. <laughs> Bhava is the main spice, and whatever <laughs> is in the way, that will be the offer. And as we know, when Vidura comes and sees the whole situation of Krishna eating banana peels, he kind of becomes angry with her wife, like what, with his wife. What are you doing? How you how are you giving Krishna banana peels? And Krishna kind of stops him, like, I never tasted banana peels like these. Probably he never tasted banana peels, <laughs> but on top of that, like these. So, again, that's not something that is pleasing to Krishna in the general list of pleasing things, pleasing stuff. But the attitude is so much full of bhav, of emotion, that even if something is not fitting with the first category, pleasing to Krishna, it's with the intention of pleasing Krishna to such a level that that's the most important thing. No? So, so basically that's the idea. And of course, I would say that <clears throat> that is this is not only applicable to like to this extraordinary example of on one extreme Yashoda, on another extreme Kamsa, but it also applies to us who somehow are in between the two, if you will. No? On one side you have like an Asura, and here you have a need to see that <laughs> um, and we are sadhakas. No? So so also we can we can learn from this because we in our daily life try to do try to engage in so many activities that we know are pleasing to Krishna, have been prescribed by by our Guru Dev as part of our sadhana bhakti. But we have to invest our will in those, within, doing them with the intention of pleasing Krishna. Not necessarily everything we are doing on a daily basis is with the intention of pleasing Krishna. You follow my point? You, you may get, I mean, I'm not saying you have the intention of 
something wrong with him, but you get distracted. No? You may be worshiping the deity and the intention maybe at one point is not pleasing Krishna because you are thinking who knows about what, or chanting Japa. And the mood is not to please Krishna, but maybe you please me no? and, and not in the most extraordinary way. <laughs> Or things like this, or whatever may be the case. Each one has to. So my the point is, the bhakti we are supposed to practice in this Rupa Noga school, the bhakti described by Rupa Goswami, is Uttam Bhakti is ideally constituted of actions that are pleasing to Krishna, anukulyasa sankalpa, make a firm bow, bow to accept those things that are favorable in Krishna's service. But also I will say in that part of, of the Saranagati equation, Nukuliasa Sankalpa, you know, particularly Varjana, accept those things that are favorable it means not only those things which are favorable to Krishna, but those things, accept those things which are favorable with the favorable attitude. Mm -hmm. now, try to embrace the fullest reach of favorability, <laughs> not just tell me what to do, what is, what is sacred to do, and I'll do it. But my inner my inner will is who knows where. I don't know. It's like when Arjuna is asking Krishna in the Gita, is it, is, is it enough to, to serve you with my body and to offer, to do things that please you physically? He said, no, no, I want your mind. No. <laughs> offer me your mind, which means have the intention to please me in, the, in this connection. No. So that's harder. <laughs> because in one sense, Again, it, has, it implies a lot of control of our inner world, and that's not so easy generally. Of course, we, this is not to get discouraged. We have to begin somewhere, and generally the way we begin is from a more external perspective, and gradually we are like more and more internal in our offering. In the beginning, again, we are, we are doing... I mean, before meeting the Vaishnavs, and maybe we're, we are leading a life not the most virtuous life. If you <laughs> so first of all, there's a stop to certain habits and actions which, which were not favorable for Krishna. So now we are informed there's someone called Krishna. He has an individuality, a personality. He likes stuff and dislikes stuff. So the idea of we, we try to align our life, not forcibly, but just out of attraction to the all attractive and feeling grateful and full filled with so many things that came to us so I'm doing my best to try to engage in those things that I know I like like he likes like Guru Maharaj will say you know, if you want to love someone you know, the person if you know she, the girl likes red I will appear with a red sweater or she likes apple I have an extra apple <laughs> and so on so you start like to to pay attention to what the other person likes you choose that it's not that someone is forcing you but you of course, in this case, it's something ideally from a <clears throat> selfless perspective, gradually. So, so we have to begin somewhere. So eventually, yeah, we will try to, we will be concerned. I want to be informed and educated what's, which are those things that Krishna like. And you get to know Krishna more by doing so. Who is Krishna? He's a person. He has likes, dislikes, <laughs> associates, and, and this. And so you start to enter into that world and try to, one of one way of entering into that world is again trying to align your present sense of self with that world, what Krishna likes, what Guru likes, Vaishnava likes. That's hard enough <laughs> because they have very refined, uh, they're connoisseurs, so they have very refined taste. It's not that I'm pleased with you doing this and that nonsense. No, no, <laughs> that won't please them. So again, it's that's not so easy as it sounds. No, try to align your life with what Krishna Guru Vaishnavas like, <laughs> and when you get to know about that, it's like, oh my gosh! This, I mean, they only like deep depth and, and, and broad-mindedness and, and 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 surrender and integrity, authenticity, humility, and, and, and oh my god, all the things that I don't have, all the things they like, all the things I lack. <laughs> They like what I lack, if you want to make the play of words. Again, not to get discouraged, but that's the beginning. like, oops. <laughs> but again, you say, but I, I want to love them. You know, I, I want to, to, be, to endear myself to them because I'm feeling so much coming from that side. So I will 
again, not in an erotic way, not in a forced way, but I will make some effort to try to to replace this list. No, <laughs> again, the beginning. Okay, align those things that are favorable for Krishna embrace, and you realize, oh my gosh, what I, what is favorable for Krishna? I have felt that as unfavorable for so many years. And what's unfavorable for Krishna Bhakti were all my favorite stuff. <laughs> so now I have to, you know, to turn the whole list upside down. So that may take some time. Again, it's not just like, give me, tell me what to do, what not to do, press the button, I'm there. I mean, <laughs> fortunately, it's not that easy. No, if it would be that easy, ooh, who knows what will happen with us. No? Like, <laughs> So it takes some time, but again, that's not the all in all, because you get to align eventually yourself externally to do the to lead externally your life in a saintly manner, if you will. <laughs> you develop these habits and behaviors and all the proper things to do. Again, not in a way of I like to like people and and only I will I will be a nice girl, a nice boy, and do whatever I have to. No, not from that side, from a social need of acceptance only that can happen so be careful all the things can mix in the name of bhakti but eventually in time to to again develop a concern that i want to have an intention to please krishna I, I, it's not enough just to do externally what krishna likes okay he likes i worship the altar i chant Srinam, i did this and uh, okay but where i am internally in those offerings again i am somewhere we are not just totally hypocrite or something, but how much I can become more part of the offering myself. Because as we know, at the end of the day, the offering is us. Sarva Artha Atma Guru says about how to repay your debt with the Guru. Sarva Artha Atma Arpanam. Give him all your wealth, all your soul, present all that as an offering. Of course, as your wealth doesn't mean necessarily empty your bank account and, and and trust Krishna or something. But all those things you feel they are wealth for you, all things that you find there's some value, somehow you have to make that an offering and to he, she who is the most valuable person in your life, basically. Sarva Arta Atma, Atma means your whole being is to be given. Because why? Because from the other side, the whole being is being given. Of course, you are not supposed to fully give yourself if you don't feel, I mean, force yourself to give yourself. <laughs> if you don't feel the other on the other side, that's also going on. It may be dysfunctional. But ideally, if Sri Guru is bona fide, that, that will be the case. That person is fully giving himself, herself. So naturally, we are invited to, to reciprocate in the same currency. <laughs> Atmarpana, Dikshakali Bhaktakali, Atma Samarpana. Chaitanya Chaitanya says, What does it mean, Diksha? Chaitanya Chaitanya says, In the moment of Diksha, when you make of your own self a full offering unto the feet of Krishna. So you, you start to wonder, Oh, did I, did I receive Diksha yet then? <laughs> I mean, Sarva, is a Diksha Kali, Bhakta Kari. Diksha Kali means at the time of Diksha, Bhakta Kari, the Bhakta, what he does he do, he should do. Atma Samarpana. So Atma means comprehensive, tip to toe. <laughs> Sama Arpana. Arpana means offering, Sama means complete. One makes a complete offering out of oneself. So again, Diksha is a process. It may take time. <laughs> but I, I will say that it's important for us as sadhakas to, to, to contemplate these things, to reflect. Again, not, and, and it's never enough how many times I had to say that, but not in a neurotic way, <laughs> but not in a complacent way. Again, this is the, the concept of this last visit to North Carolina, it seems. <laughs> on one side, you have neurosis. On the other hand, side, you have complacency, the two extremes of the pendulum. None of them are ideal options, but middle point between neurosis and complacency. <laughs> Find your middle point between neurosis and complacency, something like that. No? Because we may just jump from one to the other. If not. No. I became neurotic, I'm going crazy, doesn't work. 
oh, no, 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 no. I don't want anyone to tell me anything. I want to just be myself and relax and be free. But you end up being complacent. And at one point, it's, it's not comfortable anymore. But you are still don't have the maturity to be to the middle point. And you, you jump again like, no, I have to be like this. And I have to do this and that. And you over-idealize and put all these goals. And I have to be like, whatever, Janava Takuran in a weekend. <laughs> and wait for the next weekend. And no more Takuran is there at all. No. So, but in a sustainable way, we have to, we should think about these things. How can I... How can I choose? How can I make use of my will? I mean, I am a, I'm an individual, so that's what makes Krishna Bhakti so special. I, I choose, I mean, I'm not like matter. I'm not just like forced to do all the things without any type of choice whatsoever. So how can I invest my, my capacity of will, whatever free will I have? <laughs> how can I choose in the proper direction to invest myself to have a, an attitude of giving pleasure to the object of my affection that's a choice we have at every moment basically <laughs> it's, it's at every moment and in many moments again it's not that we are thinking i hate krishna <laughs> it's just that we may be in like in in nirvana mode or something <laughs> some form of limbo mm -hmm. emotional limbo you are doing something more like doo, 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 doo. especially in this age with so much mechanistic dynamics are there more and more so it's very subtle how much it's very subtle i mean we can without noticing entering more than necessary into those frequencies and yeah on some level become a machine ourselves mm -hmm. no in this book that you were scanning the other day which is the shallows speaks about what the internet is doing to our brains that is a very interesting analysis on how through through the the times different like main there are some main important points in our history which kind of shape our brain which is quite plastic if you will <laughs> to adapt and start to work in another form no? and, and, and three main points mentioned there of course there may be others but he will say one is maps mapping yeah because before maps we have a certain way of conceiving no? breadth, mm -hmm. length, space, and mm -hmm. and after that it, it shaped reality in a particular way. I won't enter into the details now. Then comes time or the clock. No? It mm -hmm. starts to to create a particular way of inner inner working, also inner timing, <laughs> and then internet. No? Of course, I'm just mentioning them, but he's analyzing like in detail how all these things starts like to to reshape our way of being and seeing things without us noticing because it's so much into the age we are. So it's part of the deal. <laughs> but I'm saying all the things in, this, in the sense of many of the things have to do with industrial era, mechanistic like operation. So without noticing, we may on some level ride that wave. You know? And that can be like overflow. <laughs> To our bhakti practice where we may be doing something robotic yeah in a robotic way no but internally i'm i'm not even thinking about it's not again it's not that i have bad intentions i i, I just i do not care for having intention mm -hmm. <laughs> so i don't think what's worse <laughs> but we forget about i mean i'm doing something in which i have the possibility of fully investing myself with the most favorable loving attitude but sometimes we just lose the chance. Again, not to get discouraged, but just to analyze how things sometimes happen. Like we have the choice. I can, in this precise moment, be chanting this particular round of Maha Mantra and trying to choose myself to offer myself in the most favorable way for Krishna or pray for offering myself in the best possible way. Or I have the option of keep chanting externally but not doing nothing of that internally and just thinking about my shopping list in one hour or, or whatever, which is okay. You have to do your shopping list, but not at that moment. <laughs> but again, it's a gradual process. No? As I mentioned in the beginning, we may start doing unfavorable things externally and internally. <laughs> Eventually, we externally start to behave favorably for Krishna 
while still the mind goes to many unfavorable sections. And another level, we behave favorable for Krishna and our mind goes to another sections which are not unfavorable and are connected with service, but somehow are not like an emotional investment that the moment requires. Mm -hmm. So gradually we are getting closer, my point is. No? It's, it's almost more and more in the devotional circle. <laughs> At one point, you may be chanting Japa, and maybe you are not chanting with the attitude of giving pleasure to Srinam, but you are thinking about what would I cook later for Radhamada or something. It still is in the realm of Seva, but that's not the moment to think. <laughs> the fall. But better that you think in that thing that who knows what. So, so gradually, one is getting closer and closer to, the, to that type of emotional investment in a permanent way. So, so that has to do with this idea of not only doing something which is favorable for Krishna, but with the intention of. Uh, so that's that's very will affirming. Uh, where tradition is very much will affirming. Uh, yesterday I was reading something from one devotee, which I, it makes lots of sense. Of course, he was speaking about uh, Lila Shmaranam. And, and a certain series of practices that generally we do not follow that much as part of our sudden and certain stages. But besides that difference, he was speaking about this practice was like, okay, he, they were sitting and in meditation trying to think about the daily lilas of Radha and Krishna or Mahaprabhu according to how they are describing Shastra, of course, not just whatever comes to my mind. <laughs> so you need to... First of all, to discipline your mind, to learn those sequences, to have a, like a perimeter, <laughs> Shastric perimeter, so your mind doesn't think, okay, now Krishna is going shopping to whatever grocery store, and now he's playing electric guitar. No, 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 there is some Shastric perimeter. But in the context of that, he'll say, you, there's place for exercising your will and serving them in that dynamics according to how you like. No. I mean, his main point there was like, you are expected to offer your will in those moments. It's not just I sit it passively and let everything happen. And I'm just like witnessing. You are expected to, to participate. And participate means I have will, I have taste, some attraction, and I offer myself in service in that kind of... And, and, and he was describing how difficult that is, <laughs> because in many cases, how 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 much we are not how less accustomed we are to exercise our will in in the most refined possible way. Because again, in many ways, we are just accustomed to follow what the majority of people is doing, to be told what to do, to not think for ourselves, to just buy what the fashion say, whatever the case, no, but just it, the general current is follow the current, don't swim against it or whatever. <laughs> so it's, it's a, which is a form interestingly on another <laughs> level, but it's a form of Maya bath. It's a form of impersonalism because you are not a person, you are not an individual. You no. Know? So I remember reading once from from one devoted that idea, and Purna Chandra Swami mentioned this very nice book, Unspoken Obstacles in the Path of Bhakti. Mm -hmm. And he speaks about there because we, we condemn impersonalism, but we are Mayabats in many ways, he said. No? Because if we just become one more face in the crowd without your own thinking criteria and opinion, that's a form of Brahma Sayuja, he will say. You are trying to merge into the crowd and do not exercise your own will but just let others do and tell, and you just, in the name of being humble and surrendered, <laughs> you are not a person. You are not being brave enough to become an individual. So that's impersonalism, and that's much worse type of impersonalism than the one promoted by Sankaracharya, because Sankaracharya is overtly impersonalism. Say, we want Brahma Sayuja. This is the deal for us. But... In the other case, you will say, I want Golok Brindavan and eternally serve Radha and Krishna in this particular relationship. But you are not walking the talk. <laughs> Between your walk and the talk is a crash, big accident. <laughs> so that may create a, a higher dysfunctionality for you yourself and for whoever receives your distorted 
message and example, no? So, and all, and again, all that is rooted in, I mean, I'm saying all this for us to realize <laughs> <laughs> which are the implications of, of being a devotee, basically. No, 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 again, not to get like overwhelmed or discouraged, but just to, to not be simplistic, no? I'm thinking, ah, la, 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 Hare Krishna, and I'm there, no? But you are expected to be a full person, whole person, and to play out all the implications, what does it mean to be a person, an individual? What does it mean to be personalistic, monotheistic? What does it mean to not be impersonalistic? Maybe sometimes it's better to frame the, <laughs> the question in that way. <laughs> and it has a lot to do with this, no? with ex exerting, you say, exerting our will. Again, of course, there are stages. I don't expect someone coming day one to fully exert the will and have proper criteria. I mean, at the beginning, you you cannot say too much. You know, you go first day to study, I don't know, architecture in the university. And the teacher says, shut up and listen, basically, for a few years. <laughs> and it's okay. But at some point, you are expected to, to be a person, no? No longer, just you are no longer a baby taking pacifier from mom or something. No? You have to have your own career and life and criteria and do your so that similarly applies in, in the devotional context. So I think it's important to, and it's tied with this idea no, of choosing. And it's not only choosing, and, and <laughs> it's not only choosing to do something with the intention of pleasing Krishna, but in time, which intention to please, please Krishna? Because it's not just a generic thing also. No, you have doing something that pleases Krishna on one level. Okay, we have to begin somewhere. Doing with the intention of pleasing Krishna, okay, but that can be a generic intention of pleasing Krishna, which is on some level okay, but on some other level, the intention has to become more and more specific because which Krishna I want to please? There are so many Krishnas <laughs> according to specific uh, affinity. Eventually, you may feel there will be a particular corresponding Krishna with corresponding tastes in the context of Sakya. Madhurya, Patsalya. So there's, there will be a very specific way of offering yourself to that Krishna in a pleasurable way. So again, my point is everything will become more and more and more and more specific, more and more and more personalist, personalistic. And you are expected to follow suit in, into all that because that which means to really get to establish a relationship with someone for eternity. And that someone is not someone <laughs> is the one. So it will be particularly very, very specific. I mean, once one devotee described Raga Mark, Raga Nuga Bhakti as the path of specificity. I really like that. No, it's not it's not a path of generic conceptions. And you just sometimes I hear devotees saying, no, you just chant 16 rounds, follow the four regs, and at the end of this life. Vishnu Dutas will come and take you to back home, back to Godhead, and end of the story. Hmm? By Srila Prabhupada's mercy, because he said that once and something. I mean, I under I respect and understand that, but that's that's I mean that's lending itself to some form of complacency and laziness in many cases. <laughs> because nowhere in Shastra it say that again. There, it's not no 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 words about intention. It's just do that thing, do do things which are favorable for Krishna. Okay, but with intention and which intention, which Krishna. <laughs> In time, all those things should become a concern for us. Again, in the beginning they may not be a concern, but in time, yes, because again you, you get to discover a particular form of Krishna, particular form of Mahaprabhu, particular. Situation in the Leela, mm -hmm. Chirada, Associates. So, I mean, you are expected to fit in one of those windows, <laughs> but you just cannot fit generically. Just, you just jump there, hello, here I am, and what can I do for service? I mean, <laughs> there are certain laws in the, in, in the Leela and in the experience of Ras, as we know, someone, may, someone brought to Mahaprabhu a certain poem and, and, and that had to pass first through Swarup Damodar. He wouldn't hear the poem directly because if, if it contains some improper mixtures of this type of elements, individual elements, Mahabharata will be so disturbed because he was in such a high 
subtle level of relishment that if something was not according to that delicate flow, that will create a big <laughs> disturbance. So, so that's the point. No? How much it had, how much all this will become specific. Now, it's not that Mahaprabhu was a snob or something. Like, no, I, I need my agent to filter whatever offerings are coming because I'm such a exquisite relisher. It's not from that side, no, but they are basically in a very, very specific situation, much more of what, what can we can imagine. So there is such a degree of specificity that if you, in a, in a very specific situation, you just want to bro bring a very general stuff, that's the servants. <laughs> you follow, you follow my point, no? mm -hmm. Like if you became very acquainted with whatever arts, you no know, cooking arts, of music arts, and you know how to do certain things in a very detailed way, and, and someone comes and does something in a very general way, I mean, of course you may appreciate that, but it's like so much more can be done. That's not the all in all. Mm -hmm. Especially when the other person thinks this is the all in all. Okay. <laughs> I just think like, oh my gosh, no. So much more can be done from here. So, so this, this is connected with this idea no, of <clears throat> offering, offering our individuality in a relishable way. That's basically mm -hmm. the goal of our life, no? to present our individuality in a way that is relishable for our guardians, if you will. So we are working on that. No? I have my individuality, I'm individual, how I can I carve it <laughs> in such a way that it becomes tastier, no? an offering, no? as Guru Maharaj will say, no, you have to put that to cook, we have to cook ourselves, no? we have to enter the fire, but also we have to know how much we can deal with the fire, no? and not to be reduced to ashes, confirmed. <laughs> but if you don't get closer enough to to the fire, you will remain raw. No? And we that's not the final offering. No? <laughs> the Guru Parampara there. <laughs> so anyhow, some thoughts regarding this point of... I, I, there's a lot to, to explore in that direction. No? Free will, agency, individuality, specificity, <laughs> and, and, and favorable intention, and how how that favorability is taking different shapes along in our progress. No? I mean, I think all of us on some level are, are aware of this. If you travel in time, I don't know, some years back or to the beginning years till now, and which was like one's conception of serving Krishna or doing something for the pleasure in the beginning, maybe it was more generic and yeah, Krishna, Narayan and this and that, or we don't, didn't have very we didn't maybe have a more, I don't know, Christian projection of who Krishna is, and we would try to serve from that sense. And in time, all this becomes more specific. Now we start to know who Krishna actually is and who we want to be actually in relation to who he is. We don't want to be someone in relation with who he is not. <laughs> so it's important to get to know the object of our affection because that will define how we fit there basically no? and that's why many times our charity was will emphasize first know the sadhya and then you will know the sadhana of course it's not that in day one you can know the, the, the ultimate details of your goal but start knowing in a generic way what's your goal and on the basis on what's your goal let's say bring down and now the, again very general way yet but specific on a good level <laughs> So knowing that, okay, there is a corresponding sadhana to attain that goal. But if you engage in, in practice without knowing what's the goal, I mean, which is the focus of your practice. That's why Mahaprabhu was Ramananda Roy. Sadhya sadhana tattva. Speak to me about sadhya sadhana tattva. He didn't say sadhana sadhya tattva. He says sadhana sadhya sadhana tattva. First the goal, Ramananda Roy promote. Pro suggested all these different levels, Tim Mahaprabhu would say, okay, I'm satisfied. And he put his hand in the mouth of Ramananda, enough. <laughs> and he said, okay, now tell me the practice to attain that goal. <laughs> so that, that's the system, if you will. That's the, the sequence. First, you have to have a, 
an idea of the goal, and there will be a corresponding practice towards that goal. And of course, in the context of that same practice, the idea of the goal will become more and more specific. <laughs> and your practice will become in turn more and more specific. You cannot just wait to have the ultimate last detail of a specificity, and only then you practice, begin practice. <laughs> and that may never happen. <laughs> that will happen through the practice. But some general idea of the goal of the practice has to be there with your istadev, if you will, in, in the Sampradaya and so on. And Sri Guru will establish that, okay, sadhana begins under his auspices. But then in that context, again, the goal becomes more detailed, more specific, and we became more sensitive to detail and specificity in ourselves. We realize, yeah, you know, I kind of I don't want to offer myself to Krishna in a general way. <laughs> no, I want to, and again, not neurotic. <laughs> when I say in a very detailed way, I'm not saying became obsessive or anything, but just again, when you love someone, you really want to to be concerned about all these things that will make that person uh, happy and to have that intention. <clears throat> well, it's, it's very useful to like to have darshan of the, of the different emotions and bhavas of different associates of, as we were speaking the other day, you know, how Krishna Das Kavirash Goswami depicts the last, explains the last verse of Shikshastakam with different verses spoken by Radha through, through himself and how she expresses herself as her healthy, natural, organic obsession <laughs> with the pleasure of Krishna and what she's willing to do for that to happen. Of course, for us, that may sound like too much, but that's showing you how, how, how extreme love can be, if you will, in the good sense of the term. So those things help us to realize, okay, that's the goal to attain again. It's, it's not that I can imitate that, but the potential to get closer to that is there. And I feel moved by hearing those descriptions. I feel inspired. That's how it works. That's how you will eventually just, I want to go there. I want to go there. It's, it's not that it will come just out of your own. One day you will awake and say, I would like, without knowing the Vaishnavas, I want to serve in the wake of the Priyanarma Sak. I mean, you don't even have a clue. What's that? But eventually you we receive all these different portals by grace, by revelation and and, and, and you hear how they invest themselves, how they're willing us poetically say millions of times in one second to relieve their uh, their beloveds <laughs> for the least. It's, it's not like, I don't know, sometimes Shirad is having one drop of perspiration uh, on, on, on one of her assistants is like, what's going on? Why? Why my Swamini has to go through that anxiety? I'm ready, I'm prepared to die millions of times to relieve her from that drop. <laughs> and again, for many of us, it may sound like that's too much. I mean, you have some psychological problem here. It's just one drop of perspiration. Life goes on. <laughs> so again, you need also the proper the proper backing so when you hear those things you don't feel where i mean, i think i'm surrounded by some weird people here you know, they are just their goal is to to die for a drop of perspiration millions of time what's going on? <laughs> this is some newcomer comes and asks you what's the goal of your practice say something more generic <laughs> please <laughs> but <laughs> But that's the disposition. You know? Like one day, I remember that idea came, I think last year here during our class on, on Gadadar Pandit Sabir Bhav. And basically the idea was, I think we spoke a little bit about his appearance day this year, that at one point we will be, I mean, we are no, I mean, I'm nobody, but at the same time, by the grace of Bhakti and by the arrangement of, of Lila Shakti, we will be so important in the Lila. <laughs> we will be so required on a daily basis for assisting our the object of our affection. And in the dynamics of the Lila, the dynamics specifically, for example, of the romantic uh, Lila of Radha and Krishna, whether you are in Manjari, whether you are in Priyanarma Saka, or even in Gore Lila with Mahaprabhu tasting all this, on many occasions on a daily basis, you will be required to save their lives of them in separation. If you are assisting Sri Radha, she will be dying in separation of Krishna. And her life will depend on you. 
<laughs> of course, as a sadhaka, we will think, oh, my life depends on you. But when, uh, you, uh, the closer you get to the lila, again, we say, why am I? I mean, God depends, his life depends on me. It's like, makes no sense. But in lila, it all plays out in that way. Mm -hmm. So, oh, and, and for Priyanarma Saka, similar. Krishna will be dying in separation from Shirad, and the Priyanarma Saka is expected to know how to serve him, support him, give him hope at that moment, and recite the proper prayer, the proper sing songs, and make the proper arrangements and messages and support and so on. So you have to save the life of Radha and Krishna on a daily basis for eternity. That's how much required you will be there. That's an important task. So the point is how to prepare for that. <laughs> That's not a joke. That's my point. It's, it's a very specific situation. Do you follow? It's not just, I'll do something with intention, favorable intention for them. Yeah, but in this particular moment, they need that you save their lives. So that's pretty specific. <laughs> so you have to offer yourself in a very specific and favorable way so the lila can go on. Of course, they will never die <laughs> because you will be able to do that. If not, you will be allowed to enter there. It will be a disaster if not. <laughs> So you will only be allowed to enter as long as you are able to serve their life on a daily basis. <laughs> so again, I, I don't want to sound like too, wow, well, Maharaj, that's like too idealistic. And I mean, yeah, on one level, it, it may sound quite far, but that way, it, the, the converging point is, ends there. And the Gorlil is a similar dynamic. So and that's pretty specific. So so. Basically that, no, it's, it's, it's a very, very will affirming our individuality, our individual existence will be of such importance that, again, they will require us to that level every single day forever, for the rest of forever. Mm -hmm. In a humble way, no, we have to take all this. Anyhow, I think we reach a high point here. Um, it's one hour, eight minutes, so I think it's <laughs> an auspicious moment to wrap up and close our session here with our Harikata to rest. So thank you so much to all of you. Sri Lagurudev Ki Jai, Sri Man Mahaprabhu Ki Jai, Sri Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai, Sri Sri Gaur Adamadav Ki Jai, Gaur Bhaktavinda Ki Jai, Gaur Praman Haribo, Vancha Kalpata Rubhya Shadi Basindu Bhai Vachavati Tanam Pavani Pi Vaishnavi Vyunamon Mahan Takoti Vaishnavrinda Ki Jai Gaur Haribo.